Good evening. My name is Michael Shannon. I'm the Dean and Professor of the Faculty of Nursing and Midwifery at the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. On behalf of the board and the executives, welcome to the programme of Fellows, Members and Friends events. It's a great privilege that you're all joining us this evening. Our theme this evening focuses on nursing and midwifery, entrepreneurship, connecting the dots with the bedside. And it's an absolute privilege to welcome Gillian Berry, founder of Person Technologies and Networks. Gillian is a nurse, a qualified nurse, and in a former life was a clinical nurse specialist. And she is driven by quality, patient safety, and person-centered care. Gillian holds a higher diploma in coronary care nursing, a postgraduate diploma in, in infection prevention and control, and numerous other qualifications to include clinical trials management and medical affairs and certification in quality and safety. Gillian founded Person Technologies in 2019 in a response to the challenges that she felt was not being addressed in healthcare. And she was supported by the first national HIHI Call for Health Innovation Hub Ireland. Her company was established to create person-centered, innovative solutions to clinical unmet, unmet needs, and it aims to use scientific knowledge and the latest technologies to complement clinical evidence-based practice in collaboration with the Tyndall Institute in Cork. Gillian was one of 33 health innovative enthusiasts selected to participate as a wildcard in the EIT Health Hackathon. And she also completed in Amsterdam for a prize pot of 4 million euros. What an amazing achievement. Gillian recently participated in the Codex 4SMES event in Paris, along with other major events to her honor and her credibility. She is co-founded of OS VX Open Source Volunteers Extended, which attracted over 1,000 STEM professional volunteers in collaboration with academic institutes, SEMs, and multinationals um, innovators from various projects right across Europe, Ireland, and the world. Gillian was Mayo Businesswoman of the Year in 2021. And she has an amazing journey in clinical innovation, entrepreneurship, and person-centered care. What an amazing nurse and what an amazing leader. Enjoy the evening and I'll hand you over to Professor Thomas Kearns, our Executive Director. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, I just want to add how excited I am to welcome Gillian and colleagues this evening to the Faculty of Nursing and Midwifery in RCSI. The concept of entrepreneurship and innovation really excites me, but almost excites me too late in my career. I'm really honoured to know Jill as an Irish nurse, innovator and entrepreneur. And indeed, my colleague who joins us tonight, the, the wonderful Dr. Ken Dion, who is the Sigma president, a global leader, academic and entrepreneur as well. They're the only two entrepreneurs that I know in nursing. With these colleagues have, what these colleagues have in common is a passion for innovation and collaboration. To work up solutions to our everyday challenges, to mock them up and go to design and, pro and, product and production, sorry. Who better to do such things in healthcare than all of us colleagues who work in clinical practice and on the front line? I think such an exciting journey for us all, and indeed a challenge for us all in healthcare is facing us this evening. This is an opportunity for us. The way the evening is going to progress is that Gillian is going to talk to you on technology and innovation and on the projects 
that she has led on from an entrepreneurship within a public hospital system, setting up a company to bring real life solutions to fruition. She will add lessons learned in creating a voluntary open source community at the start of a pandemic. She has invited an amazing panel who I've just had a chance to get to know before we started from Ireland and from all over the world. She presents with us tonight an array of multidisciplinary healthcare workers and colleagues who have, who have seen a need and taken a leap of faith. Most of the panel, she has helped with their journeys and indeed most of the panel have helped her with hers. And I think that's the message for us tonight. If we collaborate, if we can co-create, we can find solutions through technology and innovation that challenge us in a ever changing healthcare environment. Each of the panel that Gillian will introduce later will present a one page slide to demonstrate their product or service or their journey from the bedside to entrepreneurship. Also, they will give a short elevator pitch with their journey from the bedside. I hand you over to my friend and colleague, Gillian. Thanks very much. Hi, Gillian. Sorry, are you able to? You're, are you able to unmute? Um, try again oh there Can we you hear go me now? <laughs> yes perfect <laughs> for some reason okay and i'll send i'll share my screen now you've disabled sharing screens so you need to enable me to share a screen yes perfect you're sharing okay. great Apologies about that. I hope you can see it now. And I use Zoom every day of the week. So um, technology, these things can happen. So thank you so much for, for greeting me, um, Professor Kearns. It's great to be here and it's great to honor all nurses and all healthcare workers, as well as carers um, in this innovative sphere, which is, which is brilliant. So creating the dots from the bedside was the idea I had when, when I was asked to actually talk about entrepreneurship and as well as talking about entrepreneurship, even though I did get business person of the year, I would see myself as a natural clinical innovator from the bed space through, through to fruition. And the majority of the panel here are real true life in entrepreneurs that are bringing businesses together to help uh, the clinical outcomes of our patients. So creating person-centered innovative solutions to clinical and societal unmet needs is what I actually do best. And I want you to come and take a journey with me from the entre entrepreneur nurse at the bedside within the public health system. My career break that I took to work on my own medical device um, to fruition, and that was disrupted by the pandemic, which made a new pathway for me to help with the pandemic itself. And then I'll explore from that the lessons I learned within creating the voluntary open source community at the start of the pandemic. So translating ideas into meaningful contributions is a challenge worth taking, and ideas are about people. They're about meeting their unmet needs, and they're about the feelings and the experiences that are created. It is a human connection, and it's the positive outcomes that a really good product or service can bring. And tonight we'll take you on that journey with lots of different projects and services that are making a true difference globally within Ireland and throughout the world. 
we look back to the history, it's not just now that nurses are starting to, to, to come to fruition and uh, healthcare workers. We know that Florence Nightingale back in the Crimean War made a huge difference when she noticed that more people were dying of infection in their wounds rather than the battlefield wounds themselves. So she, she looked at the environment, she felt it was filthy, and she looked at disinfecting areas and washing hands. And it's so, so important, as we know today, especially in the pandemic, how good hand hygiene, amongst other things, can help prevent infection. So Florence Guy Nightingale was one of these leaders in the early days. As well as that, we can look at Francis Rind, in the 1800s, he was an Irish physician and doctor who invented the hollow needle used in hypodermic syringes. As we know today, how important that was in the last year with all our vaccinations, millions and millions of people um, got their vaccination through the hypodermic syringe and needle, which was invented by an Irish physician. So let, let us look at a, another bit of history, and this is me. So who said selfies were a new phenomenon? This is my first selfie in 1995. This was me on my first day in clinical placement as a student nurse. Um, I had a disposal little camera, if you all remember those, that had a mini flash, and unbeknownst to myself, this was a selfie. I took a quick picture. There was no one around. And I actually found it about 10 years later in the camera when I actually went and, and, and got it done. So it was a beautiful surprise. And that was in Letterkenny. So I trained in Letterkenny General and I moved from there to um, Connolly Hospital, which is in the RCSI region and, and their partners with the RCSI. Um, in Connolly Hospital, I specialised in coronary care and I'd done my post my actual HDIP and CCU over 20 years ago, and that was with the Royal College of Surgeons, yourselves, um, and it was a great learning experience. From that, I moved on to um, the Galway Clinic. I was education facilitator there, and I also worked in Mayo General as practice development facilitator. So when did I start innovating? I probably started innovating at the very early stages in CCU, and it would have been patient leaflets, um, organising the CCU in terms of, uh, it was a new CCU in a new hospital. Of course, nurses were not involved in any of the design or orientation. However, when we moved into the CCU, it just was not designed for purpose. So we had to do a lot of moving and, and to and from and or ergonomics and organization to make it work within the system. So the, as I say, then I moved on to Mayo General and I worked on um, in, in, in practice development, I actually went and, and done a few projects on the sidelines. So I created lots of information boards, quality assurance systems, and, and many other things, as well as creating them. I got them physically made, put up, and utilized. So that's kind of one of my many areas of talent. I sent since then created some communication boards that has been utilized and wrote about actually in the Galway Clinic, increasing their person-centered capability. Um, and it was a lovely project to do because I have a great relationship with the nursing team in the Galway Clinic as well. So this is the EPROST. You might see the EPROST was something that I helped um, implement and design in Mayo General Hospital or University Hospital. It was electronic patient and risk assessment and screening tool for acute hospitals. There is actually all the risk assessments that we generally do and a few extra um, for admission and we can both do them solo and together. So it would be everything from your falls tool, your water low, your pain, your must, your wounds, um, your delirium and your frailty, as well as bed rails assessment and manual handling. So when I had done this and I actually went and I, I looked and seen how it was being utilised at the bedside, I discovered that actually there was a certain cohort of patients that were not being catered for, and that was the immobile patient. And why was that? They're the highest risk for any risk assessment. And why did that happen? Well, it happened because there was uh, perhaps there was a hoist available or there was no other way of weighing the patient. Um, sometimes it was the middle of the night, so it, it, we would be under the assumption, perhaps timing, um, perhaps not enough staff. 
There's various different ways and actually hoisting is quite undignified as you can imagine. So I started looking, okay, what could I do next? You know, surely there has been some improvements in this area. And at the time there was no improvements in the area since the time in 1995, I qualified. So I looked further and the Health Innovation Hub of Ireland were, were seeking people from both healthcare and externally. It was their very first inaugural year um, to put up ideas. So I actually gave them lots of ideas thinking I was just passing it on to them. It was from my quality uh, process right through to um, this way device. And I had two particular designs for the way device. Now I've since gone and worked with Tyndall Institute to get a proof concept, what I call the rollway. Um, it is one that is ease of use, as you can imagine. Um, and using all the tools that a nurse can have that it makes it safe for the patient and for the nurse themselves. That's another story. As you can imagine, I ended up moving to other things. But before I started, got the confidence to go ahead and, and take my career break, I, I joined up with Empower um, Her, which is the female entrepreneurship within GMIT structures. And it was an absolutely brilliant program. It was one day a week. Um, I took time out of work for that um, and made up my hours. It was very, very, it was a brilliant program. It was knowledge based, but no funding. And I have to add, and um, this is where I met Trina as well, and she'll be talking later on. Um, I, I created Person Technologies and Person, as you can see, is person centered, but it's said person. So it's all about the person. It's all about the clinical need. I also at the same time joined up with Network Ireland Mayo. And again, it was another way of getting support with females. And you didn't have to have your own business at the time. You could actually be an employee or anyone interested in innovating or getting some networking together. So it was a brilliant support all around. From that, I finally dipped my toes, took my career break, and there were some competitions, and you've mentioned it, the wildcard. The wildcard is the biggest clinical competition a hackathon base in, in, in Europe, and I was very lucky. I, I, I entered and I got on the program, got in with the rollway, but unfortunately I was told that, oh, Jill, we love your idea, but you're a philanthropist, and my response was, I may be a philanthropist, but I have no money. And they came back to me, but you could be working on this other billion dollar company. They need your help more. So like a fool, forgive me, I actually went and helped that other company. Um, and it was a brilliant project. It was a, it was a, um, a biomarker for uh, premature labor. And it was a fantastic product. So that week designed the whole capability got all the patterns from, from, from all the different areas. And I, we were ready. We had a whole product marketed and serviced by the end of a week. But unfortunately, we did not win the prize. But anyway, so the HIHI have been a great support to me and also EIT Health, which I am on the board and the alumni board of, of the community with Timo, who you'll meet later on, Nurse Beam. He's over the Nordics and I'm over UK Ireland, again, a voluntary role. And I've also spent a lot of time on a few other programs with them. And that was the four IP, which was um, intellectual property. So I learned all about intellectual property and got some funding to, to, to acquire some support. And also, as you see in the bottom picture here, you can see Timo at the edge and Sonia should be there as well. That's when we were on a European tour and we were in a particular simulation based area in a hospital here so fantastic opportunity it was two months duration and we got to tour and pitch all throughout Europe to the likes of GE and Pfizer um, and various other areas between Grenoble Madrid etc so it was a great a great few months of, of a career break I may I add and this is our alumni as I say it's a multidisciplinary community of innovators building the future of healthcare by alumni for alumni so that's pretty much who we are and we're open to others and anyone joining in as well once you once you join a program or a webinar you're welcome to come into the community so from that what else has happened okay I was in a big competition again European funding However, this was March 2020, and we all know what happened in March 2020. Um, I kind of held off my matchmaking 
And as it was the year of the nurse, I put all of my different skills to play. You've heard about my qualifications, everything from infection control, right to critical care, uh, medical devices, uh, medical affairs, and um, I've got clinical trials management. So putting it all together, I created an open source community. I first started off with an international community looking at ventilators. Then we brought brought it back to Ireland and they're originally looking for ventilators. And at the same time, I was helping out the, the UCG group as well with their ventilators. They asked me to come in as a clinical uh, support, which I did. But from that, within about a few days, I felt there was a lot more we can do. At the end of the day, infection prevention control is just that. It's about prevention. So why are we looking at ventilators if we won't have nurses or or anyone to actually work the ventilators we need to prevent the infection and stop it happening so that's how we created osvx so it was osv was open source ventilators we created osvx which was open source volunteers extended and from that we worked on many different projects and as i say it was a bit of a fight with the original team so i was sent off to do create a new slack channel as i did and start from the beginning with roaching which i was very grateful to have as my sidekick and support so two women we took on the men and we we, we created something brilliant so as i say you know do it in the way that leads other to join you and fight for the things you care about and that's what we did we created a slack channel there was a lot of little kind of roadblocks along the way, but we created something that was meaningful with brilliant volunteers. There was 60,000 Slack contributions. There was 1,500 volunteers within a week. Now, obviously that came down a little bit. There was 500 active members within this Slack group. And we managed it by creating different channels. As you can see, we created 45 different channels initially. We looked at governance, general, we looked at research pros, uh, portals, announcements, we looked at our legal and regulatory, but we also had our 45 projects where I co-created with lots of nurses on the ground floor in the initial stages, what would happen if a baby was being born? What would happen if they were going from theatre down to the ward? And looked at all the various scenarios and came out up with solutions, created channels, got a lot of people together. We had two, we deliberately had two project managers for two projects. If someone got sick or because they're volunteers, it, it just removed a lot of pressure from people. It worked really well. And we worked solidly for nearly six months. These are all volunteers who helped and they were just amazing. We had companies bring us team of people as well. And we had companies testing a lot of stuff for us. So what happened on day two, can you believe it? There was a tweet done in the early stages by a respiratory consultant in St. James's. And she was quite crying on Twitter that they had no PPE. The government and others were saying we had three months supply. So it appeared to be more a logistics issue rather than no PPE, but we know that those PPE was not getting to nursing homes. It wasn't getting to outbreak areas. So we had an amazing person on the team, Merv, who, who actually worked in a kitchen company or owned a kitchen company. He's part of a biker group and we got together, discussed what they could do. So he created, he got his biker group together, got a WhatsApp channel together and got over 1000 volunteers made phone calls, made emails out to pharmacies, out to pharmaceutical companies, construction companies. As you know, a lot of those were being closed down temporarily. So we robbed from the rich and gave to the poor. We had a whole logistics going on with 1,000 bikers. They all got their stickers, as you can see the sticker on the, on the picture here of Team OSV. Uh, Bravo, Charlie Tango was born and they had Slack channels. They are WhatsApp groups, shall I say. Logistically, it was done between Ireland and Merv's sister in Italy. Um, and there was literally thousands upon thousands and thousands of PPE, various things, even ice cream, even pseudo cream, you name it, tulips. They were delivered all around the country where they were needed at the given time. And they actually done this for nearly, uh, nearly a year you know, before they weren't needed again. So it was an amazing group of people. Other areas we looked at, we looked at COVID. So COVID is COVID education. In March, 2020, we had COVID education out. 
sending it around Ireland and around the world. We looked at everything from PPE right down to um, going home safe checklists. We've done it in five different languages. And as well as that, the middle one here is no language, a bit like your safety card in, in your airplane flight. Everybody and anyone could understand what they were seeing. We done color and black and white to look at low resource countries as well. And we felt every project we done, we had a normal resource and a low resource alternative, which we utilized with people from Calcutta in various different ways of what they had available to them in any given time. So that was pretty amazing. And that was run by myself in terms but as mainly uh, there was a, a doctor actually in the Mayo Clinic in America and she was really worried she was um, from a Latino country and she was worried that people wouldn't know what to do healthcare workers didn't have the basic knowledge of infection prevention and control so we looked at the doffing the donning the stay, staying safe and we got these to all of those countries at the fairly age early stage before COVID got to them um, so it's something that is brilliant and it was a great teamwork session and there's lots of stuff on YouTube as well to see how they worked in, on our channels. We've done a transfer of knowledge as well and that was literally, we got, you know, everything from West Bic to other people speaking, we got the army and talking and we, we had webinars every single week live, we had asked me anything, we had questions on masks, you name it we were open and transparent in everything we did and we obviously we had no money so it was all transfer of knowledge and great people and uh, this is just a small caption just to show you a couple of things we've done and the type of people that came in and helped us and assisted us we had um Qualio gave us a full QMS, which is a quality management system in relation to making sure quality and medical devices and regulation was met. We had UCD, we had DCU, we had Multivac, we had Westbic, uh, we had um, Depuisensis, which is part of J&J, &J. we had Bench, uh, Mar Bench, I can't even think of the name now, down in Cork. Um, you name it with masks for all Ireland, which is Mary, she invented a, a lovely a mask, which I tested in the master surgery, which was phenomenal um, orientation. I'll explain more about it later. We had Boston Scientific, and we also had helpful engineers come and join us for some of our things. This is Mary. Mary is a phenomenal uh, woman. She's an aeronautical engineer, but she also is a bespoke a uh, lingerie designer for wedding wear. So she created masks for all Ireland in early March. She designed the mask you can see in the middle. It was a, a, a double layered with a, a room for a filter that actually had a full back in it and it actually ensured a fabulous fit, which is, as you know, is really important for masks. She had over 1000 sewists and they called it factories of one. So they all created the same mask. There was a structure where it was sent out to people. People had to wash it 60 degrees before they used it. And they had volunteers making masks when there was no masks available. And they got them to nursing homes. They got them to community people and everything. And it was just phenomenal. Um, this picture there uh, beside it is actually myself uh, testing the masks in the master surgery. Um, it was a brand new, it was a lab, it was their old surgery that was set up as a COVID lab. And we used Sherling technique with uh, engineers from UCD, uh, Kevin Nolan, and we got to test all the masks and visors. And I know for a fact, the fact that what we did in terms of testing for visors, we got the government to look at the guidance not to have open visors within the food industry and other areas at the beginning which people were wearing so we did make huge changes even though we mightn't have been listened to too much in terms of it as you can see the fluid heart tracker that was one of our projects and that is live it is software's medical device so we went through all the channels all the legals all the regulatory again with zero finance got a team together. So Norma is the lead nurse, um, the lead specialist community nurse for heart failure in Ireland. I used to be on Inca with her, the Irish Nurses Cardiovascular Association Committee. I seen something on Twitter that she was worried about her patients. Remember this again is March 2020. I rang her up. I said, Norma, what's wrong? She says, I'm worried. The patients, we're all relocated, as you know. And she said, the patients mightn't go to their doctor. They certainly don't have a nurse to call. They're worried about going to GPs. 
and I'm not sure what to do. And I said, well, how can I help? And she said she was already looking at the Spark Innovation, which is now in, in the HSC, and she was looking at doing a, flour, a fluid heart tracker. Now, myself with the rollaway in the past, I actually have apps ready to, to, to go with the rollaway, and that was looking at other different illnesses, including heart failure, where we'd look at weight as a solution to... Um, for prevention of, of deterioration. So I said, great. I said, Norma, I'll get a team together. So got an IT person, got graphic designers. So the graphics there is my sister. I got uh, regulatory, I got um, legals as well. I got uh, technical writers um, and even a voice actor. Well, she's not an actress, but she's a beautiful voice from Westport. Um, and she done all the um, the the voiceovers for the app itself. So this app, and we collaborated with the Irish Heart Foundation, and this app is available to download on Apple and, um, and Android at any stage. So the QR code is there. Um, and that is live within the organization um, and is under percent technologies, but is a, is a collaboration of nurses and patients. So it's co-patient, it, it had preclinical trials and it will have post-clinical trials and it is making a difference already to patients. And it's very simple to use. The patient designed it with us and everything is so simple because the patients themselves, you know, there's 80 and 90 year olds using this app, which is, which is phenomenal and fascinating. So I would encourage you to have a look at it. Um, in terms, we wouldn't have got anywhere really without a little leadership and people power. So the honest thing that came up out of this COVID and this open source community was honesty, transparency, empathy, um, integrity, communication, action, perseverance. And that actually all aligned with the webinar I was on just before that. And it said, what is the most important qualities we need from leaders at the moment? And that was in UCD that was carrying out a webinar. And it says the same again. You can see in the Wordle, empathy, communication, integrity, honesty, clarity, compassion. So there, that's what worked. And that's what worked with OSVX. It was all of that. Everybody respected each other and everybody listened to each other. As I say, 60,000 contributions was huge. And we went through every one of them and we made sure everything was evidence-based. Otherwise, it was removed from the channel. In relation to other things, what else do you need in terms of not just nursing and an OSVX open source for everybody here today who's going to speak in the panel? It, it, it's all about keep your head. It's all about having been able to cope and it's all about hitting your target. So in terms of hit the head space, it's humility, empathy, action and decisiveness. You have to be decisive. If you're an entrepreneur, you really have to be decisive, otherwise you do not get anywhere. In terms of coping, it's about clarity, it's about openness, it's about perseverance, and it's about energy. It's a high energy thing, being an innovator and entrepreneur, hugely important. And you really need to hit the target. And you can only hit the target with honesty, integrity, and transparency. So I would totally, you know, recommend trying to keep those areas itself. So I, as everything, I want to thank the volunteers. There's some links here for the volunteers that helped us. And there's a QR code as well that links in with the laundry. This actually was Rachel Dubber, another entrepreneur in Empower with myself and Trina, who you'll meet later on. And she designed this beautiful artwork to thank the people and the HSC and the frontline workers of Ireland. It was put on laundry bags. And as you say, the QR code was your laundry process, how to keep safe. And I'll tell you, it works. My husband last week had COVID. As people know how stressed out I was protecting my daughter, I put in all our projects in operation together, used the bags that we had got, you know, um, they weren't alginate, but they were uh, marine friendly bags that actually protected us. And none of us, thank God, uh, transmitted COVID last week, uh, within the week. And all I can say is you can break the chain. It, it can happen with good evidence-based, simple, basic infection prevention and control. From that, I suppose you can't live on fresh air. Uh, the governments, I mean, they, a lot of the places in Ireland, some used our projects, some didn't. Our projects were used worldwide. But every week, there isn't a week that doesn't go by that there isn't a clinical person who gives me a phone call and asks me how to do something. Um, so in the last 
couple of months or in the last year, I looked at health and innovation for teenagers, um, arts and health for teenagers with chronic illness. So I've done a big project on that to support Helium Arts. And I also am innovating all the time. So there's Kevin who done that Shirling technique and I've launched him in with a, a, another doctor in, the, in um, St. Vincent's where we're looking at other projects together and the, basically to improve clinical outcomes. So these will actually come to fruition in some time. So I suppose the honest thing is real innovation um, defines the unmet need and understands the real pain people have. True innovation is about people, the feelings or experience they will bring. It's about empowering the user through human factor co-design. It's about the overall impact it will have on society and it's the human connection that is created. The prize is the positive outcomes that a really good product or service can bring. And I'm so delighted that you're going to hear about all the products and services that this group of people are going to bring. Um, you'll be overwhelmed and it'll also give you all the opportunity to realize as nurses, as healthcare workers, as carers, we can all bring solutions to the table. Um, and thank you very much. And thank you, Gillian, for um, this uh, great uh, journey of connecting the dots uh, <laughs> across, across the spectrum. Uh, I'm Timo uh, Ustel from NurseBeam, uh, one of the co-founders and the CEO, uh, where we do um, also connect the dots uh, for travelers. Uh, what are the drugs they can use when they get diarrhea in different destinations? Uh, because we believe that access to quality healthcare should be as simple as chat over WhatsApp. So it's instant and convenient anywhere across the globe. And uh, what else to, than to put it into code? And uh, as Julian also mentioned, I happen to be on the board of EIT Health Alumni um, representing the Nordics. But even more than talking about me, I want to talk about all the amazing innovators we have today on the panel. Uh, so I will be going through um, very brief introductions uh, of all the panelists we have today. And then later, um, um, the panelists themselves uh, will also do a, a mini uh, three minute pitches. And uh, then we go into a full open discussion. In the meantime, if you are during the panelists' um, um, introductions or later, if you have any questions, feel free to put it in the Q&A box so we can uh, later during the discussion phase uh, pick them up and, and have a, a fruitful discussion. But, but let's start. Um, so um, first of all, uh, here today we have David Albert, uh, who is the founder and chief medical officer of uh, AliveCore. And AliveCore is uh, saving lives and transforming cardiology. So uh, they have been recognized by Fast Company uh, back in uh, 2018 as the number one most innovative uh, company in artificial intelligence. And for example, arrhythmias, they don't wait the doctor's office. They can happen anywhere. So for example, uh, David and his team, they have been creating a portable uh, personal EKG device that goes anywhere with you. Um, and it's so thin and slim as a credit card. Uh, so super easy to use and uh, gives uh, medical um, professional grade accurate uh, EKG in seconds. And this is actually not David's first rodeo. He has been doing uh, innovation since uh, 1985 uh, by founding Corzanox, um, uh, uh, later also uh, the Data Clinical uh, Corporation, and even as uh, chief uh, clinical scientist on cardiology at uh, General Electric Healthcare. He was also founder of uh, Livestone uh, Technology. So uh, many uh, great healthcare innovations. Uh, we also have on the panel uh, Sajis uh, Kesawan. Uh, he's the founder of Skillcord, and he's bringing in more than 18 years of uh, clinical nursing experience. Um, he has been full of understanding how this complicated healthcare system works uh, by having that experience on the front line. And uh, he has been gaining the insights on the healthcare delivery process. And uh, his long term vision is to build solutions that deliver uh, healthcare globally and seamlessly. And uh, he's a strong believer that uh, 
you know, guest for knowledge never dies. So uh, putting all that healthcare information together, that's what uh, Sajish is doing. Um, also in the panel, we have Connor uh, Curley. Uh, he's the founder and uh, CSO of, uh, uh, I hope I pronounced it correct, uh, Futafix. Uh, they were the world um, food innovation winner back in 2021. Uh, by just having the product on the market for five months. Can you imagine that? And uh, they are also, again, finalists uh, this year with a new product. So uh, piping up new award-winning health uh, care products every year. And they are doing uh, unique um, plant-based nutrition products uh, that have extraordinary benefits. For example, last year's Immune Fix uh, contains number of specific uh, and crucial vitamins that help you to uh, maintain your immune system. So for example, here in the European winter, um, if you want to have a community immune system, uh, talk to Connor later. And uh, he has been also a private practitioner uh, and the chairperson of the scientific and research steering group at the Irish Nutrition and Dietetic Institute. And uh, today on the panel, we have also uh, Kai Triona Waters uh, um, Crehan. Uh, she's the founder and CEO of uh, Prepare Me. And uh, she likes to call herself accidental entrepreneur. <laughs> but uh, the accident <laughs> in that sense have been really good because Prepare Me has been getting multiple awards and um, they are really doing a great job of, of uh, making the information accessible for both children and adults who have additional needs. And, uh, you know, after 20 years of working in the uh, disability sector, uh, Katriona established uh, Prepare Me um, based on what she saw, the frustration in that industry, uh, how to uh, put it all together, the, the access to uh, visual resources that would really help uh, people regardless of the perceived ability uh, to be part of their everyday life and, and whatever they have to do. Uh, on the panel, we today have also Patrick O'Hara. Uh, he is the founder of uh, Speak Ease and uh, Patrick is an entrepreneur, uh, New Frontier Phases 1 to 3 uh, alumni. And currently at Speak Ease, they are um, now doing a small portable microphone and speaker, which allows people that have respiratory illness to communicate uh, clearly and effortlessly without having uh, to remove the mask or uh, interrupting the treatment. So a way better care delivery um, in those cases. We have also uh, Rebecca uh, McManus, uh, who is the territory manager of uh, Global Enterprises at uh, Flu Pharma, and she's very good in sales. Uh, so it's not only the health innovation you need, but also how to sell things. Uh, she's master wizard in that, uh, never giving up and never settling anything so far. So uh, doing excellence um, and also doing excellence in the customer skills. And before Flow Pharma, Rebecca was also working at Pluricite and Citrix. Uh, on the panel, we also have Kate uh, Horrigan. Uh, she is registered advanced uh, nurse practitioner uh, on diabetes at Connolly Hospital, Blanchardstown. And she has been working as a diabetes uh, nurse of, since 2011, uh, so 11 years. And she has the passion for device technologies uh, as avenue for uh, enhancing self-management behaviors and improving health outcomes for people with diabetes. So uh, particularly she's interested in type one diabetes, uh, insulin pump therapy and uh, patient advocacy. And Kate regards advocacy, transparency and equal access to the best possible care as the hallmarks of gold standards in uh, diabetes healthcare provision. And last but not least, I'm very happy to see Sonia Neri here. Uh, uh, <laughs> Sonia and uh, Jill, we were together um, at the EIT program back in the summer of 2019. And Sonia is the founder and the managing director of Velola. And uh, Velola's ethos is to offer clinicians the tools to care for the patients in a manner that is safe, timely, efficient, and uh, close to home as possible. So with that in mind, Velola has developed a communication system that the healthcare providers can use um, 
as video consultations and uh, many more things. Of course, GDPR uh, compliant, and um, I'm sure uh, Sonia will tell more about that. And before doing the low lab, uh, Sonia was actually also a physiotherapist at various uh, clinical settings. So I'm very happy to welcome you all. And now we can uh, go into um, your one slide, uh, three minute pitches, starting with, uh, let me scroll back, uh, with David. So David, floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, I'm just gonna talk about uh I, i'm i'm the old man on this panel so you heard my entrepreneurial journey started uh 40 years ago basically and i graduated from medical school in the united states at duke university in 1981 uh and after i had an invention and an idea that nobody wanted to buy i told my wife with a young baby and my parents, I was gonna drop out of medicine and become an entrepreneur. And uh, my mentors at Duke University and at uh, the University of Oklahoma convinced my parents and my wife that I could always go back to medicine. I've never looked back four companies ago. And uh, today, AliveCore is a global company. Uh, we're still a small company, but uh, we, we are, uh, I can say we do more than a million dollars a week in revenue. So we're not a tiny company. And we have users literally all over the world for our personal ECG devices. Uh, today, we have a six lead ECG. So this is Eindhoven's original uh, three buckets of salt water, a huge device in your pocket. And as of a few weeks ago, we introduced literally a credit card personal ECG. We help over a million patients around the world to be connected directly to their doctor. And while I was inspired to hear Jillian's notion, I would say the same thing inspired me. And that is how can I help patients? And I think as nurses and doctors, we think if we're doing the right thing, patients first. And so thank you for inviting me here. And I look forward to uh, participating more in this uh, panel. Here's an evolution of our products company started about 10 years ago, and uh, we have a whole series of products, not only our own, but with partners such as Omron that makes blood pressure devices sold around the world, and, uh, and partners like the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, uh, developing. We have uh, uh, over 170 peer-reviewed publications and over 70 patents. So we're involved in intellectual property and clinical validation and look forward to uh, bringing better lives to patients around the world. Thank you. Thank you, Albert, uh, for this insight. And this is amazing, like uh, more than 1 million patients. Like, I mean, me coming from Estonia, we have only 1 million people. That sounds like, you know, <laughs> uh, the patients could form a country. Um, but uh, next in line, uh, Sajish, the uh, uh, floor is yours uh, for your treatment pitch. Uh, thanks, Shivam. Thanks for the intro. Uh, hi, this is Sajish. Uh, I'm uh, I'm a nurse um, based in Cork. So uh, I'm I've been working uh, like trying into my entrepreneurial journey for the last uh, three three to four years. So I have set up a company called Informatics Limited. So what we do is actually we uh, we are a digital platform to where information gets exchanged. So you all know how challenging it is to get a message conveyed between A and B in healthcare. So this A and B can be a clinician or a nurse or a patient. So that's, that's the crux of the problem. So what we are trying to do is how do we make this information exchange seamless? Uh, so how, how one way of doing it is actually we, we have a product called Skill Card, so which, en which enables healthcare workers to operate medical devices safely. So like if you're operating a complex medical device, you can, our technology allows to set it up easily, troubleshoot it easily. So just you can talk to it and it'll it'll help you to set a, to operate it safely at point of care. And also we do help clinicians to exchange information with patients uh, on, on a seamless way. So so, so, so these are the uh, products which we are working on. Uh, again, talking about nursing and entrepreneurship, uh, why do why are nurses more or any clinicians more successful is because we come as a good advocate in recommending any solutions or and also we are very trustworthy. And uh, so uh, it's a it's a roller coaster ride. Uh, I still 
I'm still working tonight on a night shift as my role as the nurse. And tomorrow day, I'll be working uh, you know, on my office job, uh, looking into uh, addressing the healthcare challenges. And that's about me. Thank you, Timo. Thank you, uh, Sajish. And uh, Connor, uh, happy to, uh, to give the floor to you. And, and probably you want to even talk more about the, the word that you were nominated in. Yeah, thanks, Timo. And uh, yeah, hard job to follow those, those two guys. But um, very briefly, um, my journey really starts about 20 years ago in 2003 when I first fell ill. Um, and I spent about a fortnight, two weeks in the hospital. Had to learn how to walk again, how to talk again, even how to tie my shoelaces. And I was eventually diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. And this really shifted my focus from wanting to be a professional athlete uh, to simply wanting to get healthy and then really wanting to help others get healthy. So I decided to study dietetics after school. And after dietetics, my degree, I did my clinical doctorate um, actually at Connolly Hospital, uh, an RCSI hospital, um, um, and whereby I designed and conducted, analyzed and published over 20 human intervention studies with both adults and children across a range of areas, including hypertension, cardiomyopathy, COPD, asthma, cystic fibrosis, and autism. I won man, many awards for this work and you know, did some postdocs and worked outside of Ireland as well. But I really decided to utilize my research uh, to, formulate, to form a, a company. And I decided to leave my last full-time role at the end of 2018. Spent all of 2019 working on regulations and ethics, gearing up for a clinical trial uh, to happen at a Dublin hospital on a blood pressure formula. And this trial was about to commence in April of 2020 until COVID-19 hit and completely ruined everything. So my choice was to wait, wait until COVID was finished, but no one knew how long that would be um, or maybe get a job, but things weren't looking so rosy on that front either. Join the social welfare queue or pivot. So I decided to pivot and pivot towards immunity, but not just because of COVID, because nobody knew how long it would be around for, um, but also because of the cold and flu market every year, uh, which generally spikes um, around wintertime, um, and also because of my own immune issues with MS and also allergic asthma. So we went from a clinical trial concept to a new product concept to commercialization in less than six months during a pandemic with a very small team of one, uh, me. <laughs> uh, and I've absolutely no commercial experience and also very limited resources, including cash. Um, but thankfully, we got to launch our first product, uh, ImmuneFix, which was in November of 2020. And then, as uh, I was always mentioned, we won the World Food Innovation Award and we've now uh, exported to 27 countries. I like to keep up with the literature for my sins uh, because there's a lot of literature um, and a lot of people were coming out saying, well, you know, uh, vitamin C is good for COVID and, you know, sniffing garlic is good and so, so, so on and so forth. But just like Gillian, I like to, to stick with the evidence base. And I started seeing that there was research actually showing uh, some acute effects of um, nutrition interventions in COVID-19 patients. Um, so in November uh, of 2020, I decided to put all these elements together. Sorry, November 2021, I should say. And um, so I put seven plant-based elements together, uh, which had evidence for COVID-19 treatment um, and launched a new product called Coven Pack. So C-O-V-M-P-A-Q. Coven Pack and each ingredient corresponds to a letter. Um, I also applied for a patent for this product. And uh, there was over 50 studies uh, showing things like decreased symptoms, but right through to uh, decrease inflammatory gene expression to upregulated uh, anti-inflammatory gene expression to decrease hospitalizations and even decrease deaths. But really, I'm really excited now as hopefully we'll be able to get back to our blood pressure research. We're just on our very, very last um, ethical query with the, the hospital. And as you all know, blood pressure is a massive issue affecting over 1.4 billion adults on the planet. We think we can significantly improve this uh, with a nutrition intervention. Um, so if anyone has any interest, uh, please, uh, please contact me. Uh, and if anyone's interested in potential uh, human research collaborations, again, please get in touch and maybe I can just uh, put my contact details in the chat. But looking forward to the uh, discussion and just to finish on. So we are Fight Fix and we help fix health. Wow, this is amazing, uh, Connor. And, and I think it's, yeah, it's, it's all about what you eat. I mean, that, that has so much impact on, on your health. So. Um, very exciting uh, and, and probably in the future more products in the pipeline. But now uh, I'm happy to give the floor to uh, Kai Triona. Hi everyone, um, lovely to meet you all virtually. So my name is Trina and I'm the founder of Prepare Me. 
And my story is that I've spent the last 20 years uh, working as a social care worker on the front line within disability services in Ireland. And a large part of my career has been spent supporting autistic children and adults who also would have had a diagnosis of intellectual disability and very often might have come into our services at a crisis point in their life. A huge part of my role on the front line was to help prepare and support someone for whatever their day had in store. And that could be quite literally anything. It might be a visit to their GP, a hospital procedure, or it could even be, you know, visiting a cinema for the first time at the age of 26. Anyone who has ever worked in this sector or with this particular population will understand that visual information is paramount when you are communicating with people who might not use words to speak or might have a unique and individual communication style. You know, the line, a picture is worth a thousand words. Very true in this particular sector. So I was hugely frustrated at how difficult and arduous it was to get your hands on the visual information that you needed to prepare and support somebody for an activity in life. How could it be that accessing visual information to communicate common activities could just be so hard? And why was it that I could create one resource where I was and a parent or a professional elsewhere might need that very same support, but have to go out, find the images that they need, format them in a meaningful way, and still have time for their focus person to process the information before the activity. I was even more frustrated by the fact that a distinct lack of this type of information very often led to really dramatic and very traumatic consequences for the children and adults that I supported. I often heard people say or assume that the reason that somebody had a huge meltdown in their doctors was because they were autistic and had an intellectual disability. The truth was that the very person that was expected to be at the center and core of the activity received the least, if any, preparation information or support so they could know what to expect and what might be expected of them, by whom and for how long. People that are scared and feel without control will try to keep themselves safe, safe any way that they can exactly what we all would do if we were in that situation. And so Prepare Me was born quite by accident and more by frustration and an inability to kind of leave a hard day at work. Um, and we are currently building an innovative web platform that will allow families and professionals to quickly and easily create meaningful visual resources that include things like video models or picture stories that might have audio attached. We're also creating a database of ready-made content, which supports many of the activities that we already know are very stressful. And platform users will be able to edit this content to meet the bespoke communication needs of the child or adult that they support. There is a huge difference between not having the capacity to understand something and just not getting the opportunity. Information is power, and it's power that isn't ours to own and power that we absolutely have a responsibility to share. So our tagline is, don't just tell me, show me, prepare me. Thanks so much for listening. That's amazing, Katrina. And, and it's, yeah, all about visual. Actually, you know, even think like centuries ago, the cave paintings in the caves of, it was, it was visual information, not the letters. So I think we are, have to sometimes go back in time to, to have that uh, communication. But uh, next in line, we are delighted to have Patrick um, on the floor. So the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Uh, so my name is Patrick O'Hara, and I created the Speakeasy communication device for people who wear non-invasive ventilation masks, um, people who usually have uh, chronic respiratory illnesses. Uh, just a quick uh, demonstration of what I have created. So I'm just going to put this on. I'm not going to leave it on for too long. <laughs> Um, so you can't really hear me speak, it's kind of all gone here. Okay. Uh, 
So that's pretty much the basics of it. I wanted to give like a little bit of a demonstration. But I suppose um, where, where it all began would have been back in the end of 2019. Uh, my father, who had COPD at the time, um, he had uh, a bit of a downfall and he was in ICU for about a week. Um, when he came out of ICU, he had the non-invasive ventilation mask on for about two weeks. And I was traveling up and down from Limerick to Mayo uh, trying to go visit him, but every time I did, you know, you, you couldn't really talk or communicate properly. Um, so from there, I kind of decided to go online to try and see if I could find something that could help him communicate, um, but I couldn't. So I got in contact with the, my old college, LIT, uh, which is TUS now, um, and we kind of communicated back and forth before they said for me to apply for the New Frontiers program. Um, so for about a year, I was on the New Frontiers program, finishing up on phases one, two, and three successfully. And I went from idea stage to the device that you see now. Um, unfortunately, though, um, in April 2021, uh, my dad passed away before I was able to use him like I used to tell him he'd be the guinea pig, guinea pig for me. Um, so I wasn't able to uh, use the device or to help him relieve him of his stress. And while we were at home, we could kind of, I suppose the NIV mask kind of helps people um, stay at home for longer. It, it's a great way of treatment and there's studies to show to back that up. So, so the mask isn't really a problem. It's, it, the mask is actually becoming a solution, but it's, it's the problem that's being created on the side, which is the barrier of communication. And you can see the frustration between families and, 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 and the patient themselves when they're trying to communicate. Um, so yeah, I, I pretty much had the device ready by uh, September, 2021. And from there now, what I'm trying to do is gather funding uh, to improve the device. Um, I'll just give you a little quick show of what it actually looks like. So this is the speaker box here. Uh, there's the connections here. Um, and it, it, it's a little bit, it's not the prettiest looking thing right now, <laughs> but uh, it, it's to get it over the line as the next stage um, to be able to bring it into clinical trials and to be able to be used safely. It's safe now, but you need to get the checks done and the certifications. So um, yeah, that's pretty much my idea. I'm, I'm very glad that I was asked by Gillian to come join here because I met Gillian back um, at the beginning of the, the my, my journey, I suppose, from initially from the bedside up until now. Um, so yeah, very, very thankful. Everyone here is, is amazing. I, I, I feel like I'm pretty much a, a baby legs at this stage, but um, hopefully I'll get to your kind of caliber uh, not too far away in the future. And um, thanks a million for having me. That's awesome, Patrick. And, and thank you for showing the live demonstration of the device as well. Like I think, uh, as Katrina said, like one visual says more than a thousand words, one demo definitely says also more than a thousand words. Um, but next in line, uh, we are happy to hear more uh, what Rebecca is doing. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Um, so my name is Rebecca McManus. I'm the founder of Amethyst Care. So we are the voice technology companion that helps care for the elderly at home, keeping them independent for, lo for longer. Um, and it works with an Alexa device. So who am I? So my background's commercial. So I've worked in tech sales for the last eight years for a number of different companies. Um, however, I've, both, I've been a caregiver to both parents at different stages of life. So my father now has advanced stage Parkinson's and Louis Body's dementia. He's only 66, so he would have been quite young when he was diagnosed and he's now in a nursing home. And I would have been around say 12 at the time of his, his diagnosis. So in regards to the problem, I started working on this project about two years ago. And um, so from being a caregiver, I noticed that, you know, the market is saturated with product. There's a lot out there in terms of like apps and tablets, but they can be quite, some products are quite costly, clunky and invasive. Um, but where I noticed there was a gap in the market was people that suffer with mobility related illness. And um, like if you have Parkinson's disease, tremors is something that is a big problem. So using the likes of any tablets and uh, computers or apps would be quite challenging. So my goal then is to leverage voice technology as a way to solve that problem and help care for the elderly at home, especially people suffering with mobility related illness. And um, so in terms of the technology, so as I said, it sits on top of an Alexa device. It acts as a companion to the patient at home and it helps with things like medication reminders. So it would check in to see if they've taken their medications on time. Uh, would also check in to see how they're feeling throughout the day at different stages. So if they weren't feeling bad, if they were feeling bad or they were feeling unwell, it would trigger an intervention to contact the family caregiver to let them know to check in on their loved one. So we also have, if they are unresponsive for 
throughout the day, if they haven't been speaking with the tool, it would also trigger an intervention to contact them because that might suggest that maybe they couldn't get out of bed or you know maybe they'd had a fall. We also have a quiz or a memory test that's based on the six CIT cognitive assessment. So I suppose in terms of our long-term goal, it's to capture patient insights and see performance over time, potentially then pinpointing the exact stage of cognitive decline. Often when people get to diagnosed with the likes of dementia, they're quite far gone. And it's about finding out at what point you know, is someone forgetful and did they just forget their keys? And at what point, you know, is it a cognitive illness? And um, so that would then allow for things like early intervention or preventative measurements to be put in place. So in terms of the team, we're up to four people internally and then four on the advisory team. Uh, the product is just recently built um, and we're just about to start piloting now next week. Um, and I've also in the last year done the patient innovation bootcamp with EIT and uh, previously New Frontiers with Enterprise Ireland. So thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Rebecca, and <laughs> and also uh, adding to this new technologies. Like you know, uh, I think it's amazing how, for example, direct devices like Alexa. Uh, there, nobody in the beginning used, but now there are so many use cases that you can just like uh, build your businesses on that and and uh, having good uh, use case. But uh, we also have here a Kate who has been doing some innovation in the field of healthcare. Kate, you are muted. Hi, everyone. Hey. Um, hi, so I'm, I'm Kate Harrigan. I'm an advanced nurse practitioner in Connolly Hospital. I guess um, my journey started when I became a diabetes nurse in diabetes. and um, I think what really started my uh, journey towards, I'm not sure if you can call it innovation or entrepreneurship, but pay, pay person-centered care was really thinking that if I was a person with type one or type two diabetes, I probably wouldn't be doing uh, as good a job as maybe I should be doing. I probably wouldn't turn up for my appointments. I might not take my insulin when I was supposed to. I definitely wouldn't adhere to the recommendations in regards to meal times, etc. cetera. Um, so I guess my, my journey started in, in mostly in advocacy and empathy and putting myself in a person's shoes um, and, and figuring out how best I can empower them and make them feel like they are able to manage their, their own situation and almost just enable them to have a different perspective on their own, on their own health. Um, I guess then the landscape in regards to diabetes changed in, in 2016, uh, whereby lots of new technologies came on board for people with diabetes. So instead of having to prick their finger six to eight times a day when they were taking insulin, then they, they were able to wear a device on their arm or their stomach where they would get access to a glucose straight away. Um, and this was an amazing innovation and it was such a, a life changing um, improvement for people's quality of life. But I guess it created this space within healthcare that they needed probably guidance. They needed to understand how the device worked. They needed to know whether or not we felt that this or healthcare professionals, by that, that's what I mean by we, um, felt that this device was trustworthy. Was it reliable? So really the the the. The service that I kind of created for my patient population was, was driven by the fact that patients needed it, per, the people with type 1 diabetes needed it, and that so it was very much driven by that population rather than me myself. Um, so basically, I we designated a space within every working week whereby we would see everyone who was on this specific type of technology. So continuous glucose monitoring technologies or flash glucose monitoring technologies. And um, we created a, a technology clinic whereby we would interface with people through either a phone call or a WhatsApp or a virtual call. And we would be able to also interface with the, with the cloud-based technology. So it really changed how um, I interacted with my patients and, and I guess it also gave them uh, a different way of, of interacting with their healthcare provider. Well, awesome. Uh, thank you so much for sharing this, Kate, because I think every one of 
us knows uh, at least uh, a few uh, diabetes patients and how complicated the life was without the technologies that very happy to see that that there are like things again like coming there to to help you out and and uh, making the life easier for the patients and last but not least uh, i'm very happy to uh, to bring to the floor sonia i'm going to share my screen if that's okay just to keep me on track <laughs> sure <laughs> So uh, first and foremost, just huge congratulations to the people that have spoke before me. Um, it's really nice to be here of an evening when a lot of difficult things are happening in the world to share some really positive, good news stories about humans that are doing good things for one another. So I'm really proud actually to be here. I'm very grateful to Gillian for inviting me. Um, I'm Sonia Neary. I'm a physiotherapist by trade. I'm also the uh, CEO and co-founder at a Dublin-based digital health software company called Wellola. Um, at the heart of what we do, ultimately we want to ensure that only the sickest of the sick are cared for in a hospital setting. Um, and I'm just going to talk briefly about why that matters to me. Um, I, I worked in, in many healthcare settings in public and private sector where I saw patients sitting in hospital beds that were not acutely unwell, that would have preferred to be cared for where possible in the comfort of their own home. I know personally that that would be my preference if I was not acutely unstable and unwell. Um, and therefore, I began as a home care physiotherapist. Uh, I worked in residential care settings um, and I thought, well, why not, why not do this uh, with the support of the technology that we have available? Available at our fingertips. Certainly every other industry in the world seems to be delivering everything online. Why can't we do that uh, with healthcare? So what I did in collaboration with two of my co-founders, uh, my, my co-founders are Dr. Greg Martin, who's an epidemiologist, um, and Christoro kudlitin Lochtna, who's our CTO, previously would have worked with the likes of IBM and Merrill Lynch, et cetera, is that we developed um, over the course of our number of years, uh, a communications platform that um, ultimately plugs into the system in a hospital or it plugs into the system in a, in a practice. It consists of eight core modules that allow for communication in many ways between healthcare providers and their patients. Um, it matters because it offers huge cost savings on things like traveling for healthcare, paper, post, no-shows, but ultimately it facilitates community-based preventative care delivery through things such as the symptom tracking, video consultation module, educational resources module, etc. Um, how we collaborate, you know, obviously in healthcare, the only way things work is through combining resources as stakeholders. So we work in collaboration with patients, we work in collaboration with clinicians and personnel in clinical settings. Um, and, and I'm here really to reach out to those of you on the call today that feel that perhaps there is a collaboration that's aligned, either a project that you're working on in your organization that might benefit from uh, some of our know-how or some of our technology. Um, and equally, we are always here to learn from yourselves and, and what your requirements are. So again, very grateful to be here today and there my contact details and I'd love to hear from any of you on the call that have any questions about entrepreneurship, about technology, um, or just to have a chat in general. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing this, Sonia, and, and all the ones who are watching us today. You know, you don't have to be afraid of us. I mean, even though we are like uh, medical professionals, we don't have the syringes or scalpels with us today, so <laughs> don't, don't be afraid uh, to put your questions in the Q&A section. And I see some of you have already done it. Um, and, and currently we can kickstart uh, the discussion where, um, I mean, uh, I see the, one of the first questions was how to overcome this fear or take the plunge. Uh, um, and David was also answering in the text, but but a uh, first step and the plunge is to ask a question from this amazing audience today. So that would be your easiest uh, thing to overcome. Uh, so put your questions uh, in the Q&A section. And, and this first question for this audience as well, I see uh, um, that was one question, but uh, Ashley is now also asking um, uh, what should be introduced uh, in the nursing curriculum to foster more innovation uh, because everybody, you guys, you took the plunge, <laughs> you did something on your own, but what do you think uh, is the thing that 
um, Ashley could put into the nursing curriculum that it would be not just like, I don't know, uh, 1% uh, of innovators, but you could get so much more healthcare professionals uh, to join our ranks, to take this plunge and, and uh, push forward healthcare innovations in, in so many other fields, because there are, I think, more than 100,000 diseases. Uh, like many things we heard today are very niche specific. So uh, we could get at least 10,000 more innovations maybe next year. So um, who would like to, I would make it like an open question. So uh, an open mic, uh, who has a great idea, what should be included in the nursing curriculum to foster more uh, healthcare innovation coming from the roots up? Can I take that question? Sure. It's, it's um, almost like a, a setup. Hi, Ashley. I, I don't know who you are, Ashley, but um, I've actually been doing that myself. Uh, I am working with a, a cohort of undergraduate nursing students recently started and from day one um, brought in innovation creativity and we'll be bringing it all along the program. So brought it in in terms of communication. We've done pebble art actually on canvases and this was a cohort of uh, nursing students who hadn't done art since primary school. So that was the first uh, dose of creativity. Um, today, I, I used sure up, the SureWash app, they all downloaded it for their hand hygiene. And recent studies have shown in Glasgow that eight weeks of using the app for SureWash, um, you create muscle memory, and that's been researched and proven. So I actually have the SureWash technology, the, the, the big machine, I'm going using that tomorrow um, in terms of, of hand hygiene and hand washing. So I suppose that's something I'm going to be bringing in and happy to share, Ashley, I'm not sure where you are, but happy to, you know, partner partner up uh show you you know a little bit of an innovation and how it's done and in terms of where would funding come well there's a few programs at the minute there's funding through um eit health uh, and eit european innovation technology itself there's ones looking at creativity and art but there's also funding for education so there's up to i think two million funding in relation to partnerships across europe how you bring entrepreneurship and innovation into the curriculum for or any um, college or university, uh, public or private. So that, that's my answer. And uh, it wasn't a set up, but a uh, great question. Does anyone would like to add the, what magic we should uh, add to the, to the new generation that are currently in the school and studying something from your experience? Because like you, as you have been grinding through the entrepreneurship ranks in the last uh, decades, uh, what would be something that um, that you would uh, wish uh, they would learn? You know, I might just come in there. Sure. Um, I, I think it's so important that it's a part of a curriculum, that there's innovation and that there's spontaneity and creativity. But I guess it's really important that that's really valued and encouraged during the clinical practice as well, that people can think outside the box and that they can problem solve. And then that's really encouraged within the clinical setting, because I think sometimes, particularly when you're a student, you might be afraid of making mistakes or afraid of asking questions. And that can sometimes inhibit your creativity. So I think just having an environment where that's really nurtured is would be really within the clinical setting is really important. Awesome. And and I actually have one add on question uh, coming in that that maybe it's like one thing is taking the plunge, but then probably everybody knows that entrepreneurship journey is, is not all like going up the hill and, and cheerful, but, but often that's a very hard grind uh, with very deep lows. And I see that the question coming in from Kenneth is asking like, what is that one thing that would get you through the most difficult days of entrepreneurs? So I think a number of you here on the panel today you, you have getting awards, you have been having successful exits. I think uh, David has done quite a number of successful exits, but, but I'm sure that all of you have had also very, very tough days, very tough decisions making. So what was the stuff that helped you to get through that uh, deepest canyon of, of maybe despair into a mountaintop of, of success? Well, I, I will start. First of all, I've been married for 38 years. 
I have four children, two grandchildren, and looking my wife in the eye and telling her that it wasn't going to work always seemed like a really bad idea that I didn't want to cross. And so, you know, the motivation of your loved ones, of disappointing people, can be can get you through a lot of things. And, and I think if you, you, one thing you have to be, you have to be very honest with yourself. You have to assess, is what I'm doing really going to work? If you're not honest with yourself, uh, if you can't convince yourself that you're on the right track, you'll never convince others. They will always sense the doubt. And so you have to be, you know, when you, when you hit a low, when things don't go your way, you have to redouble that self-evaluation. Am I doing the right thing? Is this the right path? And if it is, then uh, you, you, you buck it up and keep going. I think that's amazing uh, um, advice that, you know, you go back to the roots and think that, that uh, is it the right thing? And, and often I think it's also like linked to maybe the product itself that I think what we had the stories here today, number of people who are like, you know, it came from personal pain. It's not the random thing out there, but, you know, solve the problem that people can relate to that. Any other great tips uh, from the panel how to overcome those things uh, besides uh, the advice um, from David? I think uh, wine helps. Um, so does fast food, coffee, all helps. Um, crying helps an awful lot, you know, allow yourself to have significant meltdowns where you're akin to a three-year-old having a major tantrum um, and let it all out. Uh, declare that you're giving up and really believe it for the, the moment that you're in it um, and allow yourself to take some comfort from that. You do, I don't have to do this anymore. Um, and probably if I had to pick one thing that actually really did help me was I have pictures, I'm not in my office, but I have pictures of the children and adults that were involved in our pilot programs or that I was directly involved with personally or professionally over the years and they are all over um, a wall in my office and I'll tell you something on your crappy days it is very hard to look even in the direction of that wall and still be motivated to continue to give up um, and I think I think, you know, sometimes the language around this stuff is it gives it still gives me the heebie jeebies. I don't particularly like the word innovation or entrepreneurship. I don't feel like they should be attached to me. And as regards curriculum for for nurses, et cetera, I think, you know, layman's terms is better. Uh, I never grew out of the why stage of childhood. And anybody going into a new career that's on the front line of anything should be encouraged to never grow out of the why stage. Question everything just because something is the way that it is you can convince yourself, well, it has to be this way because somebody else would have changed it. That's nonsense. Ordinary people are entrepreneurs. Um, but yeah, try and give, try and have something that will kind of keep you, keep you going on your, on your tough days. And the last thing is people only do this if not doing it is worse than trying to do it. And that is definitely my truth. So believe me, I wouldn't have done any of this if, Leaving it alone was easier, but it was so frustrating and so annoying to me to just let it be. Trying was was easier, at least. Awesome, uh, awesome motivation to, to have that visual reminders, because like you're also working on the visual product. So having that visual reminders around you and uh, helping to those to get uh, you across. But I see that uh, Sonia wants to follow up. Thanks. Yeah, just to add to the other speakers, I, I definitely think it's really important to surround yourself by positive people and also people that are going through the same thing as you are. So on this call alone, there's a handful of you that I know really well, you know, through the network of entrepreneurship. Um, and I, I, I just think you really need that. On the down days, it's very difficult to call your friend who has a nine to five, who's never done, you know, it's quite frightening going out there. And every day is really, really high and really, really low over the course of 24 hours. And unless you're in it, you don't really get it. Um, so I think it's really important to have the crutch that is someone who's going through it too and, and you're there listening uh, whenever they need you as well you know 
Um, the other thing, and it's a little bit like the visual metaphor, but I do actually have a couple of the quotes that I got from the couple of patients or the couple of, uh, you know, buyers that really liked the system for whatever reason. And again, on the rubbish days, I kind of look at those quotes and I kind of go, okay, well, it's working somewhere for someone. So, so I'm doing something right, you know, so it's those couple of things for me personally, yeah. Amazing. Oh, find a good mentor as well. Um, because again, I think people that have sort of trodden the path ahead of me have really helped me to get, you know, along the path myself. So, yeah. Yeah, I think it's just a link to that proverb that, you know, uh, if, you know, you can do alone a small sprint, but if it's a long marathon, you have to have friends along uh, and, and then you can reach way further. Uh, I also see that Connor wants to uh, share some good advice. Yeah, I don't, I don't know how good it will be, but just in terms of, you know, uh, the, the journey for me. So, you know, I started this by myself, uh, not by design, but by by necessity as such um, in the middle of the pandemic, while I was like kind of stuck in this office uh, with no no co-founder, no no friends, no no anybody it was me on four walls as such. And I didn't know if I was doing the right thing. And I didn't know if it would work commercially and I didn't know if it would ruin my, my sort of reputation that I built up in, uh, in academia. Um, but I guess, you know, probably about four weeks after we launched, we won a, an award from uh, an Irish society, which was really nice. And that kind of really helped. So I guess I would say really celebrate the small wins, even if it is by yourself, uh, do celebrate the wins. And I uh, definitely agree with all the other speakers, you know, about, you know, David saying, uh, I certainly don't want to disappoint my family or friends. Um, and, and Fiona saying, uh, you know, uh, maybe sometimes a wee glass of wine or something like that. Uh, at the same time, I would also say the opposite, that I really find that I do need to exercise and preferably in a green space and, and eat healthily or I'm just not going to feel good and not going to feel motivated. And I guess just agreeing with all three uh, people who just spoke before me that, you know, if I didn't believe in this, if I didn't think this was worthwhile, I wouldn't be able to do it. I wouldn't be able to have the passion for it and it just would not work and um, I wouldn't have the motivation in me. So if there's anybody listening that has something they're passionate about, that's a pretty good start. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it there. Awesome. Thank you for sharing these tips, Connor. And the last tip uh, of this round before uh, we take the next question, I see Kate wanted to, sh to share one tip as well. Uh, I just wanted to say that um, I guess, you know, in clinical practice, I, I get the feedback from the, from the person with diabetes so it's that day where nobody thinks any of your ideas are good or maybe you think that this kind of technology clinic thing wasn't actually such a good idea or maybe half the clinic don't turn up for their appointments and you're thinking god why exactly is this happening and then you might get a text on whatsapp from you know a 17 year old who hasn't come into the department in three months asking for help and it shows you that like they actually really benefit from having an accessible service with like that's not judgmental and that they feel they can utilize whenever they want it and I think that if you just put that person at the center of what you're doing on the bad days or in the days you think oh maybe this is all just a waste of time uh, I think if you put another human in 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 the in the center of it all it really picks you up from where you were before Awesome. Uh, thank you so much, Kate, for sharing that. And, and a quick follow up. I see uh, Jill wants to, to say something as well. Yeah, for me, I suppose, look, my journey has been sporadic and I, I have gone back to work. But for me, it's the energy. It's the energy when people ring me up and ask for help. That's where I get the, the energy and drive to get back. And it's I'm emotional now, but it's it's definitely the energy of others and everybody here. So I just think you're all amazing. So thank you for coming. Thank you so much, Jill, for sharing this. And, and we have one more, uh, I mean, I see the questions are coming in, that's amazing. You see, it's not dangerous, just take the plunge, put the questions in the system and be happy to take. And talking about that, we have a question from Thomas uh, for the panel. So what are the key challenges uh, you have faced in getting innovation uh, innovative ideas to design and development. So what were the bottlenecks in the journey that that were like most limiting and, and you had the biggest grind with? Okay, I, I'll start. Remember, in, in physics, there's a concept called inertia, 
A body at rest tends to stay at rest. A body in motion tends to stay in motion. Starting. They call it a startup. They don't call it a finish up. It's startup. And so you have to start. And then again, a journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. Find part. There's no such thing as an individual inventor anymore. Things in this world are so complex, it takes a team. And sometimes it takes a team, which includes nurses, doctors, physical therapists, pharmacists, lawyers. Oh my gosh, lawyers. It, it takes a team as it takes a village to help keep and raise our families. So I would just tell you, if you have a good idea, find friends you trust to bounce it off of. Pressure test it. Find people who you know who understand the area and put it to them. You Again, this is back to being honest with yourself. Get feedback. Do not do this when somebody says something negative about your idea. Take it in, answer it. Figure out why what they say isn't the end. So, you know, again, you got to start that first step. You got to start and uh, find people who can help you. You, you. you don't know how to write software. You don't know how to build a website. No, most people can't do all those things, let alone design equipment, devices, electronics. You have to find a team and you do it one step at a time. Like how you eat an elephant. How do you eat the elephant? One bite at a time. So there's my, those are my general suggestions. Uh, that's awesome, David. And, and I think even like what Neil Armstrong said that, you know, one small step for humanity, and that was the first step on the moon. And then you see now we are soon on the Mars. Uh, uh, Rebecca, I see that you wanted to share uh, your uh, tips as well. Yeah, I was, I was going to actually say very similar things to David there. So pick the right people and, and trust that you'll find those people as well. I think whatever you put out to the universe, you will get back. Um, I think like at the very start of this, I made some maybe poor decisions when it came to picking the team with people that didn't have the experience. Um, whereas like now I'm in a position where like I found people that I have really good relationships with and chemistry with that you work well together and you know what Julian was saying with like the energy and you know being able to bounce ideas off people internally and with your advisors I think is really important and um, so it's 100% the people that you work with because it's not uh, like it, it was myself for a long time doing this and it was really challenging when you're on your own so I think finding the right team is the most important thing. Awesome, uh, finding the right team. Uh, Sonia, what is your tip? Yeah, it was a couple of things. So I think the question was around what was what was difficult, what was challenging. And for me, you know, getting funding initially was quite difficult. So, you know, I don't think people appreciate that taking a product to market in the healthcare setting, it's, it's quite a particular setting. There's quite a lot of certifications and regulations and evidence-based, uh, you know, um, practice that you need to deliver in order to, in order to deploy it. So yeah, er as early as you can start investigating, you know, what innovation grants are available. Um, you know, I know SBRI would be one in the UK, uh, EIT Health obviously have some fantastic programs and funding and I benefited from Enterprise Ireland's local enterprise office uh, actually initially and then the New Frontiers programs and CSF and HPSU there's a lot of supports out there so just to learn about those as quickly as you can and try to apply for a few that might fit um, and yeah also kind of the regulatory side of things again it took me a little time to understand what exactly I needed to meet in order to be able to be, to be deployed in a healthcare setting so if you can get an advisor or access to a mentor again perhaps one that's funded by a grant to give you those insights early on so you can start that journey in parallel with your your mvp uh, development if that makes sense awesome uh, uh that's that's yeah you need money to to get things done and and i mean that's the part uh in healthcare settings where you know you can't just like do the uber style like uh, go there and break things but you know it's, it's patient lives at matter so having it it right from the the regulation is, is definitely very crucial um connor i see that you have been also um indicating to mm. jump yeah, in um just a, a couple of comments and obviously i would agree with what everybody said so far and um, 
but definitely it's it's about action you know it is about doing it uh someone just put into the chat there you know fail fast and fail hard and you just mentioned there like obviously you know this isn't a google or a an uber situation where you know if it's patient focus it can't be uh you know we can't fail as such but i think you know as clinicians we're uh oftentimes very much um we do things as they're always done um or at least that's our our default and that's like just because something's done a certain way it doesn't mean it's the best way um, and I'm sure everybody can just think of multiple examples in their, their life just today of how something could have been done better, not even in the clinical scenario. And literally innovation is just doing something a, a, a wee bit better than it was done yesterday. And I think we can all do that in the clinical sphere. Um, but just to, to mention that, you know, the first product we brought out took about six months and the second product took six weeks. Um, and all of that was because of the learning. So although you know we did get a product that we didn't fail as such like it, it was far from uh it was far from ideal and we're still you know we're still uh um you know uh we're improving that but the second product uh came came about much quicker because of the learnings of the first product so even if you don't uh, change the world with your first sort of uh uh you know prototype or whatever that certainly would mean your second prototype would be much much better and so on so so get started that would be my uh uh, and then also, as, as, as the speakers have mentioned as well, you know, do talk to some trusted colleagues who, who understand the area. Um, you know, do be aware that if you have a fantastic idea that you shouldn't be telling everybody, uh, you shouldn't be talking about it in the pub and so on. Um, but, you know, do talk to some trusted colleagues and, and get some feedback and, and, you know, get some feedback quickly. Awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Connor, for sharing this. And I see that in the meantime, we have got a new question coming in from John. And um, John is saying that in many cases, uh, in the major Irish universities, uh, they have medical societies um, and the networks. And it seems that there is like this bias of um, putting more like uh, on the top, uh, the physicians and doctors. And, and he's asking like, what is really prohibiting nurses and the allied uh, healthcare staff for being the true innovators that it's not the doctor, like, you know, patients is like, I want to see a doctor. It's like, really, you know, <laughs> how we can also put that, that change that, that mind, that innovation doesn't have to come from doctor, but it could be also coming from, every healthcare professional, including nurses, midwives, and all other uh, health professionals out there. And uh, I see Sonia has raised the hand to, to share some. Yeah, that's an interesting perspective. Like I, I feel, you know, a lot of allied healthcare professionals that I know, I think by nature as healthcare professionals, we, we study disease, right? And we try to apply something to improve the disease. So we by nature are used to looking at the problem and solving the problem, if that makes sense. And I do know quite a few people in physiotherapy who have gone into sort of digital technology. I, I do know a good few nurses, yourself and, and Jill, for example. Um, so I do, I do think it is there. I think it, it would be really valuable, you know, to that very first question to explore how do we support that even more, you know? Um, and I think it is about having modules, maybe in first year, you know, where you actually taught potentially some of the skills of an, uh, you know, entrepreneurship, you know, what does it look like if you want to set up your own business? What does it look like if you need to learn about accounts and legals and regulatory requirements? You know, that, that should be potentially something that's brought in very early, very early on in the curriculum, you know, as well as the innovation. How do we practically then implement that innovation, you know? Um, so yeah, that's an interesting perspective because I, I do meet a lot of allied healthcare professionals that do have innovation uh, at their fingertips, which is interesting. Awesome. Yeah. How to be rebellious. Teach them how to be rebellious in a good way uh, <laughs> uh, or in the school. Uh, I see, Kate, you want to share with us uh, some thoughts on this as well. Uh, I just wanted to add, uh, just to add that I, I think if you're if you're in the clinical area and you have something that you want to create or, you know, change, um, I think, you know, there's a hierarchy within clinical practice that you generally have to get permission from somebody in charge. And I think sometimes that can definitely be a barrier or you can be discouraged. And I don't know, I don't think it's because necessarily your idea is, isn't a good idea or that the innovation isn't of benefit. But I think 
um, structures within kind of health institutions, they change quite slowly. And I think maybe the pandemic has taught us that like things can change so quickly. Like the, the way that we interact with our patients has changed, you know, 360 since the pandemic began. And I think that maybe it's a lesson to the people who have more power than the frontline staff that, you know, within your, within your health system, you can be supported with innovation rather than having to go maybe do it on your own and find your own team. I just wish there'd be a bit more support within those structures, I think. That's all I wanted to say. Awesome. Uh, thank you for this, uh, Kate. And I see that, uh, Connor, you want to share something as well. Yeah, again, I think it's a, it's a really interesting question. And I'll just weigh in with a little anecdote that sometimes if I'm speaking at a conference or even a patient-focused uh, uh, talk or something like that, you know, somebody, uh, and I'm the nutrition guy, uh, somebody might ask a question about nutrition and direct it towards the doctor, not towards uh, the dietitian and the nutrition researcher. Uh, so there, there probably is a little bit of a, you know, a bias towards physicians, um, you know, going maybe dating back to when the physician was the, the most revered person in the village or whatever. Um, but I think that's changing. And I think a lot of physicians recognize as well that, you know, their clinical colleagues add a huge amount of value. And uh, I would also flip the question on its head and say, yes, physicians are fantastic and have a, a huge amount to, to bring to the table, but non-physician clinicians can, uh, can see things from a different angle, a different perspective. And, um, you know, for me as a dietitian, uh, when I work clinically, like I know that, you know, most physicians wouldn't understand, you know, what we were doing, why we were doing it and so on, because that was our area of expertise as such. So, you know, it wouldn't be a, a physician wouldn't come in and try to innovate in that area. We would bring the innovation to to the general medical team and such. And I'm sure, sure it's the same for for physiotherapy or, or nursing or midwifery or whatever it is. So um, there's there's huge opportunity for sure. Awesome. Thank you so much, Connor. And, and maybe I would twist this question even a bit more for Patrick, like Patrick. Uh, you are coming in into this field as entrepreneur, like not really having healthcare background, but then decided to innovate in the field of healthcare uh, from the outside. It's like Airbnb was, was done by two designers <laughs> into the field of hospitality and, and you were doing entrepreneurship and, and you came into healthcare. Uh, so how maybe you would think that you could encourage non-healthcare professionals to come and innovate in healthcare? Yeah, it's definitely a long road um, when you don't have the background. Um, everyone, what everyone was saying, even a lot of the questions beforehand, that they, they're all kind of related as well. I could have answered on all of them, but I think they, they kind of covered them, everything I was going to say. Um, I suppose for me, the New Frontiers program really helped because it also opened up a wide network of healthcare professionals for me. But not only that, with my device being physical, I was able to actually go to designers. I was able to go to engineer, to engineer sound engineers. Um, it, it, it's a definitely a program that if you have the little bit of a fire in you during your work day that you think I could do this better, then you definitely 100% can. It's scary, but that's the whole point of it. And I think when we first started talking about everything here, um, everyone, all the entrepreneurs kind of seemed a little bit traumatized. <laughs> we all kind of had to like, we all had all these coping mechanisms that we wanted to kind of get through. but. Uh, I think you'd, when you look back at your journey and, and the, how far you've come, I'm on about now nearly two years. And when I look back, I don't look at the bad, the negative. I only ever actually remember all the positives. And it is scary at the time and you do have a, a hard time doing it, especially when you're in a field that you just do not know anything about. Um, but again, it's the motivation of helping the people. And clearly you have that motivation as a healthcare professional because you already are in the healthcare sector and you want to help people. Um, I think it, it's already in them. So I think if you can come up and make yourself, uh, make your day a little bit easier, um, you definitely have the spirit, you definitely have the drive and 100% they can, they, can, they can get through to, to where everyone else is on the panel and stuff today. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely say, don't be afraid if you're not in the field. I wasn't an expert in anything. <laughs> um, only in what I went to college to study for, which is business management, that was it. I didn't actually know the real world and what, what it would be like. So definitely don't be afraid. And if you have an idea and if you have a way of doing something better, go and do it and, and keep the flame going, you know, and, and let it burn bright, <laughs> as they say. 
Well, thank you so much for, for these inspiring words, Patrick. And, and I see that actually we have been so engaged with the questions and, and, and things happening that we, I think, even a bit over time already. So maybe let's do just a quick last round of the panel discussion that everybody would say a few sentences, uh, the last, last words for our audience um, before we start wrapping up. So in no particular order, who wants to, to, to give that uh, last piece of ins inspiration to our, our audience. Um. Well, I I'll start, uh, you know, patience first. Whether it's your father, mother, your grandparents, your patient as a nurse or a physician or a physical therapist, see a problem and figure out the solution. That's innovation. Not all innovators become entrepreneurs, but almost every entrepreneur is an innovator and always put patients first. Okay, thank you, uh, David. Uh, so um, patients first. Uh, Rebecca, what's your tip? Our uh, last uh, good word yeah. for the audience. Um, I think, you know, I, I spoke to a lot of people and a lot of advisors, and I think just take any advice you get with a pinch of salt and take the bit that you kind of resonate with you and then just trust your gut and go with what you want to do at the same time. So it's about finding that balance between the advice you get given and then what, what you believe is the right thing to do. So having this kind of critical sense, uh, what, what is the feedback you're getting? Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much, Rebecca, for this. Um, who dares to be next? Uh, Patrick. Yeah, kind of just going off what I said earlier, don't be afraid of it. Um, kind of dive in head first is the only way you're going to get through it um, and hit the ground running. Um, it's definitely going to be, if it, I'm sure every single one of them on the panel here today was afraid and was down at one stage. Um, but as you can see that everyone got to where they need to be to this point and, and do not be afraid of where, where you're heading because if you have it in your head, you'll definitely get there. So don't worry. And there's plenty of support out there as well to help you. Awesome. Uh, thank you. So head plunge in and, and get things done. Um, um, Kate, maybe you want to say something. I just want to say thanks for having me. I don't know if I'm as much a part of this innovation group as everyone else, because I'm, I'm kind of leading from the person who has diabetes. But I guess um, it's a privilege to be on the front line and working with people and allowing them to put their trust in me. And I guess I'm just lucky that I get to work in a space that I really feel passionate about. And if you have that type of passion, I think there's lots of space for innovation and entrepreneurship, I guess. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much, Kate. And um, Connor. Yeah, I mean, I would just really echo uh, everybody, especially uh, David, who started off and Kate just saying, you know, if it is about the patient and if you genuinely believe that you can improve patient care in a big or a small way or in any sort of way, um, and that's something you're passionate about, then that is is absolutely fantastic. And uh, I think you do need to have a little bit of passion in you. You know, if you're if you're innovating in something you're not passionate about, then the dark day, the hard days will be so much harder. Um, so really, uh, you know, passion and, and patient first. And I guess it's kind of, you know, action and feel the fear. You will be fearful, but do it anyway. And I mean, um, you know, if the passion is there, you know, everybody on the call here has, has worked in some sort of job, whether it's been clinical or not. And we've all had a really bad day at work or a really long day at work. So, you know, if you can do that about something you're passionate about, which is going to innovate in the clinical setting and improve patient care, surely that's a pretty good payoff. So. Uh, Feel the fear and do it. Awesome. Thank you so much, Connor, for this. And, and Sonia, uh, what's, what's your punchline uh, for our audience? Ooh, I feel a bit under pressure, uh, but I, I've got two. <laughs> One is... <That's> okay. <laughs> I just stay really close to the end user of your solution and, and, and listen to why they don't like it. You know, so if there's a no, I don't like why it does this, I don't like how it does that, I, I would really pay attention. You know, it's quite difficult to listen to the negative feedback, but they're the gems. And that's how you enhance it and improve it so that ultimately it's, you know, serving a better purpose, right? Um, so yeah, I would stay close to the, you know, patient or the clinician, you know, get on board all the stuff that they like and don't like but pay attention to what they don't like
like so you can improve it um and the other thing is to just to really be clear on what your vision is you know what is it that's making you you know want to do this be really kind of just question yourself on what that is and then once you've got that solid any other decisions you make you kind of nearly soundboarded against that vision you know does this choice still you know align with what i wanted to do you know is this still aligned with what we want to do as a company and and that can kind of help stop the waffle which i'm doing now uh, but you know it keeps you on the straight and narrow which is really useful um it has been useful for me but you know that's my little demo too amazing <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> amazing advice uh Sonia. thank you so much and and jillian um uh, the last word is yours okay um i suppose believe in yourself that's the number one thing, believe in yourself. Um, I have to learn how to say no sometimes, you know, but um, and, and that could be my downfall, but believe in yourself and just keep the energy from everybody going and have the patient at the heart. You know, that's the whole idea of person centered. So that's it for me. Awesome. Thank you so much, Julie. And, and now I'm happy to hand over to Thomas to do the wrap up of the session. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Timo, um, Gillian and colleagues. I have to say uh, I've been bowled over by not just your presentations, your, your pitches and the panel discussion, your commitment, your energy, your enthusiasm has been inspirational. And anyone who isn't motivated listening to you guys is, in, is inert, uh, David, to be honest with you. You have been truly inspirational. What you've clearly demonstrated to me and colleagues is that we are the solutions to the challenges that we face and whether it's your father Patrick or whether it's um, the patients with diabetes Kate uh, to me you, you know it is the solutions are your solutions because you experience the challenges whether it's personal or professional you've collectively a huge experience in getting things done you, you've demonstrated phenomenal self-centered uh, resource resourcefulness, but critically how has come across as the fundamental role of support, mentorship, and your innovation alumni sounds sounds really magnificent. And I know you've been very gracious in sharing your, your contact details, whether it's LinkedIn or whether it's your uh, personal email addresses. Uh, so anybody listening today who feels they have an idea, you have in front of you a group of experts who could be your, your, your mentor going forward. To me, what has come across is that collaboration is fundamental buying in or, or borrowing the skill sets and the competencies that we do not have ourselves personally is fundamental to success. I think what came across so, so very strong is, is that the critical motivation is, is the personal. To me, uh, we need to be courageous, to be brave, to put ourselves forward. And, and you colleagues have certainly demonstrated that. But what I love the most is your belief, your values, your compassion and your passion are what really drive you forward as innovators, as collaborators and as entrepreneurs. I have been inspired tonight. I hope everybody else has been inspired as well. Thank you for your sharing. Uh, thank you for your attendance colleagues and um, for our fellows, our friends and our members, just to say our next event will take place in April. So keep uh, an eye on the Faculty of Nursing and Midwifery website and uh, our Twitter and Facebook feeds. Thanks again, Gillian, for pulling it all together. Thanks, colleagues. Good night. Take care. Bye-bye, guys. <laughs>